Joshua chapter 24, um, and before we get started, I just wanted to kind of reflect on this past week. Most of you know uh, this past week we had a revival service uh, from last Sunday morning all the way through Wednesday night, and if you missed it, you missed um, a great opportunity for God to work in your life and begin to revive you. And, and as I begin to reflect on what it really means to be revived, you begin to realize that it has to do with reviving uh, what God once had for you, you know, what's, what's once you had experienced that fire and that passion that you had, the direction you had from God, you, you'd kind of let it fall away and reviving that uh, back to the Lord where it once was um, and where God wants you with that. And I believe this text today as we walk through this is a form of revival. Um, in their instance, it's going to be a covenant renewal or a recommitment to something in which they had committed to before, but they had fallen away from and uh, this text just really speaks directly to that. And so my hope is, is that we will respond today as Israel responded at that time as a recommitment to the Lord today to serve him and serve him only. And so if you'll stand with me uh, for the reading of God's word. Again, Joshua chapter 24. And here's the thing. I'm going to read as fast as I can. I'm going to be covering 28 verses. But here's what I know. When we stand to honor God's word, we honor the God who wrote this through the writer and it's an opportunity for us to experience what God has for us. And so, if you found your place, say amen. amen. All right, Joshua chapter 24, verse 1 says this. It says, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called, them, uh, called for their elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. They presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on, on the other side of the river in the old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave the mountains to Seir to possess. But Jacob... And his children went down to Egypt. Also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterwards I brought you out. And then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your uh, fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt." Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he continued to bless you, so I delivered you out of his hand." Then you went over to the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gersh, Gashites, the Hivites, and Jerbesites. But I delivered them into your hands. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before, from before you. 
also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor and the cities which you did not build and dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us out and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in that land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve other foreign gods, then he will turn and do to you the harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. So Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore, he said, Put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to us, for it has heard all the words the Lord has spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each to his own inheritance. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you allow your word, Lord, to ring true in our ears and draw us to a point today, Lord, to to make the decision, Lord, to who we serve. And Lord, for many, uh, you may already know that, Lord, where their hearts stand, but Lord, I pray that they re recommit that today, Lord, and that they bring their lives back to you so that they may serve you all the days of their life. And Lord, we pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. You may be seated. So you may be asking this question, why did we read so much text? And here, here's what I find when I read, right? I do a lot of background study and I do a lot of other, you know, all, I'm all over the text. But what I come to figure out is if I start cutting out things, I have to do a lot of, hey, let me catch you up. And I didn't want to catch you up on this. I wanted you to see a huge part of what Joshua was calling the people of Israel to. See, Israel had been... If you look at the history of it, and if you've got time, you need to go read the book of Genesis and Exodus and then go read Joshua. You'll, you'll love um, all the background that, that really we didn't get all the details of today, but we get to hear a little uh, a example of it because Joshua wanted them to reflect. Joshua wanted Israel to reflect on what he had done for them before he called them to this. He says this, whom will you serve? And so my hope is today that through this text, again, you may have already made a decision to accept Christ. Maybe some of you haven't. But this is called a recommitment. This is a recommitment to the covenant in which they originally had. And I think many of us may have fallen away from that original commitment we made to the Lord when we surrendered our lives to him. And this text reminds us of that. You know, I find this in today's society and personally in my own life that I'm very distracted by, by all the things, right? We're, we're busy with so many different things. And, and I always make this statement as well. Sometimes I just get so busy doing other things that I forget the work of the Lord, serving the Lord, right? And I make excuses. I make excuses of every other thing because I'm busy doing those things. But the thing is, I have, I have time to do everything else but serve the Lord. That's, a, that's an excuse for me personally. And I, I realize, begin to realize this is because we're taking our eyes off the Lord. That's exactly what happened to the Israelites at this point, right? God had done all these great things for them. And as they begin to get farther and farther away from these things, they begin to set their eyes on themselves and set their eyes on other things, right? And they begin to build their own kingdoms. And what Joshua was doing, this is towards the end of Joshua's lifetime, he's bringing them back around and he's saying, now look, I want you to remember all that God has done for you. And I want you to serve the Lord. But I don't want you to do this and say this flippantly. I want you to take it honestly and, and make a, a stand today, make a covenant today to recommit your lives to the Lord and his work. See, I find this in my life uh, many times of how I can get off track, right? And I'll give you just a great example. Let's just use me because we like to, to use other people's examples, right? 
So let me just use my life in, in the life of uh, eating right and exercising right. You know, it's easy. As soon as I get started, I'm motivated. Uh, I'm seeking hard after being healthy and running and doing all these great things. And here's what happens. I start slipping. What happens? I start getting lazy. Uh, I start eating that cupcake. I start sleeping in, right? And it's, and it's slow over time, right? And I start realizing I'm adding a few pounds. And, well, you know, that's okay. It's okay. I'm going to get right back on track. And well, then all of a sudden, my pants don't fit, and that's an honest thing that happens too many times, right? Your pants don't fit, and you're like, well, I'll just get newer ones, and it's okay. I'll ignore it a little bit longer, and here's what we do. We start saying it's okay. We make excuses. It's only one day. It's only one week. It's only one sin, and then before we know it, it seems like our life is so far from the Lord, and we begin to wonder what happened, and here's what happens. We end up living in that and thinking, you know what? Well, at least I know I'm saved, um, and you know, I guess this is just the condition that I'm in, and we just begin to living with that. And here, here's usually what happens to draw us back to the Lord. Something tra tragic's got to happen. Something tragic's got to happen in order to bring us back to the Lord. I find that in our Christian walk. I don't know if you think about this. You know, you begin to pursue the Lord. You, you have this relationship with the Lord. You remember all that God's done for you. He's forgiven your sins. And you live for him, right? And then it starts happening, right? You start making poor decisions. You start... Uh, compromising in areas of your life, right? And as you begin to do that, you start making excuses, right? It's just excuses for this or that. And then as you begin to realize that you've fallen away and life's starting to fall apart, and you're starting to wonder what's going on. And you begin to live in that and saying, maybe this is just what I'm going to do. I'm going to live in this, this uh, condition that I'm in. But here's what God's saying. He's calling us to recommit. And, and what we're going to learn today, uh, and I'm hoping we have enough time to get to this point, but I want you to understand this is that it doesn't take something tragic. It doesn't take Joshua calling us to this point to recommit. It is a daily walk with Christ that should be the recommitment that you need. See, these people had fallen away from a time, uh, and then here's the thing, they're going to be constantly called back. We're gonna, if you go into the book of Judges, here's what happens. They fall away. The Lord brings wrath. He brings a judge, draws them back, they repent, and they, 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 they end up doing it again and again and again. You'll find that in life. So you ask that question, is that what has to be in our life? Do we have to be that way? Here's Joshua's life is proof that is not how we have to be. Joshua understood, here's what kept him strong all the days of his life, leading a godly example. In the first book of uh, uh, Joshua, it talks about how the Lord said, you need to hide God's word in your heart. He, you need to put the book of the law in your heart, and you need to meditate on it daily. That, I believe, that personal daily relationship with God is what kept him on the right track without falling away and needing these times. He recommitted every day in this. And so today I'm hoping we're going to use this scripture. So let's talk about the first thing that Joshua uses to help them understand whom they should serve. And I'm hoping that, again, Joshua's story resonates in our life. He uses, again their past blessings, Israel's past blessings in these first 13 verses. See, again, Joshua's at the end of his life, and he wants to make sure before he leaves that they are committed to the Lord. And before he makes this uh, commitment, he begins to review their history. And I, I've heard this statement uh, by A.T. Pearson that says this, history is his story. I hope you get that. History is his story. So for the Israelites, their history was his story in their lives. Do you understand that that your history is his story in your lives. And as you begin to understand that, that, God, that what Joshua is doing is reminding them all that God had done for them. And if you don't believe that God's done so much for you, you need to begin to stop, get rid of all the distractions, and thank that all that God has done for you to get to you, you to the point of where you're at today with that. And so they begin to take that for granted in all the things that, that God had done. But let's look at the area. They met in the area of Shechem, which was the area in which God had promised Abraham that his descendants would inherit the promised land. The land in which the Israelites were inheriting here in the book of Joshua, God had promised in this exact same area uh, to, to Abraham that they would receive that. So it was a holy area. It was an area in which made a difference, right? You, you ever get to those points, there's areas or different places in your life, when you come to those places, it reminds you of something. Grandma's home, right? You would walk in, you'd smell grandma's cookies, whatever it is, and it would ref cause you to reflect and bring back those memories. The same things happen in my life. I use this church as a great example of my, if you want to call it Shechem, or, or a place in which I reflect, right? God has done so much in this church. I spent Tuesday Rather than sitting in my office, because here's the thing, once I open the door in my office, it seems like I can't do anything but work. So I, I got away, and I came in here, and I began to sit in the seats in which I started sitting in when I first came to Crescent Valley, when I started hearing the gospel and I was lost. 
And then I begin to sit in the seats in which I've responded to the gospel, and I begin to reflect on all that God has done for me and the places that God has called me to and, and changed my life. And as I begin to reflect, I was just overwhelmed with all that God had done for me. That's exactly what Joshua is trying to do with this text. He's wanting to draw them in and help them see that reflecting is important. So here's what he did in the first four verses. He explained to Israel that God chose them. You know, Abraham and his family were idolaters. That's what it's saying here in the first four verses. It talks about whenever God went and called Abraham, he chose him. You know that Abraham didn't seek the Lord, but the Lord sought him. And that's a reminder to us that if you're in this room today, and I think that's what's so important. I'm talking to the church, but I'm also talking to those who don't know the Lord. Do you know that you're in here today because God designed you to be here? And what you may say is, hey, well, I set my alarm. You know, I found this church several weeks ago that I was going to come visit this one day. God ordained this day for you to hear his word. God chose you. And those who are in Christ, God chose you. Do you know that that did not have to be true, but he decided to be and that, by reflecting on that, that should bring you to an all moment. That should bring you to an all moment of understanding the Lord chose you. The Lord chose Israel. And in, in understanding that, that you didn't choose him, I think that helps us understand how much of a blessing it is to know the Lord. If we go on from there in verses 5 through 7, it talks about that God delivered Israel, right? God delivered Israel. He talks about here in verses 5 through 7 about how uh, he had sent uh, Joshua um, to Egypt to save them from a famine, right? Here's what Egypt does to repay them. They enslave them. But then God doesn't forget them. He sends now Moses uh, and uh, actually Aaron, and then he takes them out of Egypt. And so God delivered Israel. So he's reminding how much he had delivered them from all these things. And so it's important for us to be reminded, those who have accepted Christ, to be reminded the bondage that you were given or that you were taken out of, right? Before Christ you were dead in your sins. Before Christ, you were heading for destruction. And you may not understand that fully, but I'll explain this. A life without Christ is a life that is confusing. One that I remember living, and I was living for myself. I was living for as much financial gain as I could. I wanted the best house, the best car, the best family, the, everything you could imagine. I was doing everything for myself, but here's what I found. There was never enough. There was never enough. And I begin to always ask myself this question, there's got to be more than life than this. There's got to be more than life than this. And there was. And so when I'm reminded of what I was taken out of, God delivered us. God delivered me from my sins so that I may live with him forever, but experience him now. Amen. And this is exactly what Joshua was drawing the Israelites to, and he's wanting us to draw into. When we say, who are we serving? We're the ones that are serving the God that chose us and the God that delivered us from our sins. But he goes on and he, he's, he's not done. This is what, he, he's constantly reminding them of different things. See, God guided Israel in verses 8 through 10. God guided Israel. He brought them out of the land, uh, into the land of the Amorites. This is after they had crossed the Jordan. And this is when Joshua takes over, right? This is a land that wasn't there, but theirs, but God began to allow uh, and go before them and help possess this land, which he had promised them back to Abraham. He guided them through Joshua. And every single time that they rejected that guidance... Guess what happened? Destruction happened. There was things that happened where when they began to disobey the Lord, that he would not give them the land. They would lose their battles. And it wasn't because of how good of an army they were, but it was because of how good of a God he was to go before them and pave the way. So he guided them to this promised land. The last thing he did in verses 11 through 13 is he gave them their land. I'm going to read these verses, 11 through 13 again. He says, Then you went over... The Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho also fought against you also. And I'm not going to read them all, but all these different um, people. And he says, But I delivered them into your hand, and I sent the hornet before you, and drove them out before you also, and the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. And he's, this is what he's reminding me. Hey, I, I did this the other day. I walked through in these first 13 verses and underlined the word I. Joshua is speaking for God. I underlined all the words I. And every single one of these is the Lord saying this, I've done this for you, I've done this for you, I've done this for you. If you want to choose whom you'll serve today, I've done all these things for you. You are nothing without me. Amen. And for some of us, that may not sit well because we're independent, right? I, I'm that type of person, right? I'm prideful. I want to do things myself. I'm a man, right? But here's what God reminds us. We are nothing, absolutely nothing without them, without him. And that's what the Israelites have to remember. The land in which they are, have already inhabited, that the Lord went before them and done all these amazing things. Every bit of it is there because God 
did it, not because they did it. And he still goes to 13, he says, I've given you the land which you did not labor and the cities which you did not build, and you will dwell in them and you will eat of the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. So when we begin to look at Israel's past blessings, we see all these things, right? All these things that happen. And Joshua is reminding them of the goodness of God and all that he did for Israel. Why did he do all these things? Because he loved them. Do you know that Israel was God's people? God chose them. God loved them. Do you understand that everybody in this room is God's people? He loves you. He wants you to know him. And if you do know him, he wants you to serve him all the days of your life. And here's the reason why. It's not just because of the benefit of the Lord. It's the benefit of you. The Lord gives us so much. All these things that the Israelites got, dude, I, I, I begin to think about this. You know, I begin to think about my history, the reflection, right? And I go back to when I was born, right, reflecting on all that God had done. But do you understand that we are standing on the shoulders of the Israelites? What God did for them, he did for us. Because if he wouldn't have done that for them, we would not have the gospel today. So we, this is our story. History, his story is our story. And that's what Joshua is reminding Israel, and he should be reminding us today. He's calling them to remember their blessings because when they started taking them for granted, they began drifting away from their sincere worship of the Lord. Has that ever happened in your life where you begin to take for granted all that God's done for you? I'm pretty sure a lot of us have experienced that, where we begin to take things for granted because of all that God's done for us, because what happens? We get distracted. I'm telling you, my kids' uh, sports schedules can keep me busy alone. But if they start taking precedence over my walk with the Lord, over me serving the Lord, it has become a God, little g, in my life. And it needs to be out of my life because I am in sin. And that's exactly where the Israelites were. They allowed some things to creep into their life. They were worshiping other idols and praising them over the Lord who had delivered them. And so, again, I begin to ask you that question. Has your commitment to the Lord been lacking passion lately? Has your commitment to the Lord been lacking passion lately? And I'm hoping Joshua, just in the same way he encouraged the Israelites, they responded in passion. I'm hoping we respond in that way. And here's the reason why. We've allowed something so precious as the, our relationship with the Lord and all that God has done for us to become normal, familiar, and common in our life. If you want to know why you've lost the passion and you begin to put other things before the Lord... It's because you've allowed that which he has done for you to become common, to become normal, to become familiar, to forget all that God's done for you. You know, I don't have time to give you this whole story, but three years ago, my daughter, uh, almost actually could be almost four years ago now, it's almost four years ago, my youngest daughter um, basically was near death, right? One of the craziest experiences of our life. It brought us to our knees. It broke us. God changed our life during that time. And I believe it's the, the biggest amount of spiritual growth I've ever experienced through this tragedy, right? But it's been four years. And the farther it gets away, the easier it is to forget all that God did during that time. Reflection is important. And it's so important for us on a daily basis rather than when we're getting called to times like Joshua is saying, hey, every once in a while we're just going to get together and try to revive you, or every once in a while we're going to get together and try to have you recall all that God's done for you, it should be a daily reflection. That daily reflection will help you have a constant walk with the Lord so that we do not walk away from the Lord. So let me walk through this. God chose you. God delivered you from your past. God has guided you to this point. He has given you everything you have. And that's why I asked that question. Have you been taking God's blessings for granted? Have you been serving the Lord the way that you should? Have you been serving other things, yourself maybe? Here's what we know. Israel stopped seeking the Lord, and that's why they started worshiping other gods. And you may say this, I'm not worshiping idols. Do you know that there's many idols in our life that we don't recognize what they are? They're as simple as things like this, food, entertainment, success, money, Achievement, family, myself. Those things can become priority outside of serving the Lord. And the Lord is calling us back, just as he called them back. So let's look at this. In the next uh, 14 through 18, now Joshua's calling Israel to, the, uh, to a re- recommitment. He says this in verse 14, Now therefore, and that's basically saying, because of all the things I just shared with you, all the things that God has done, he says this, he says, Fear the Lord and serve him. 
In this section, the word serve is mentioned 15 times. The, to serve God means to fear him, to obey him, to worship him. It means to love him and to fix your heart upon him. Obeying him because you want to and not because you have to. So Joshua's calling them to a decision in this. He says this, he goes on and he says this. He says, uh, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river. And in Egypt, he says, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you, serve the Lord. Then choose yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua was calling this decision. He did not want them hanging out in neutral. Now I think this is so important for us to understand. God is not satisfied with you saying, I'm half in. He's not satisfied for you saying, well, I'm just saved. Because anytime we think we're in neutral, here's what happens. We're going backwards. Anytime we think we're coasting, anytime we think it's okay, um, it's, you know, I'm just fine in my relationship with Christ, it's not. Because you're going backwards. He doesn't want us hanging out in neutral. He doesn't want them hanging out in neutral. He didn't want them to be on both sides to try to serve one God and the Lord. He's called them to serve the Lord, and it would require them to do what? To get rid of their false gods, some of them that they were worshiping secretly. And here's what we know. Many of us are worshiping secret gods, ones that we probably, nobody else knows about. And again, it, it becomes that lust, right? It becomes that area of our life maybe that we are desiring this more than the Lord. And it becomes the thing that keeps entrapping us and causing us to falter and causing us to sin and causing us to Fear from serving the Lord the way he's called us to. And after, you begin to think about this, after he had asked them to do this, you, you begin to reflect and see all that God did for them. And you would ask maybe this question, how could after God did all that for them, right in front of them, again, we're talking about an active God that constantly went in these battles before them and defeated people. How could they serve other gods? I begin to ask myself this question. After all that God has done for me, how could I choose something else outside of serving the Lord? And it happens. And it happens. And then I begin to wonder, what, what, what happened? How did I get to that point? How did I get so far away from the Lord? And, and here's the thing. It happens just like I'm talking about with my weight gain, one pound at a time. You start slowly drifting. And you, you keep making excuses. You start slowly drifting. You start making excuses. You start looking back. And you begin to serve some other form of God outside of the one true God because you have just been so distracted by the world and those things around you. And so I think it's important here that we look at this, that Joshua wasn't suggesting that they could choose other gods. He wasn't even thinking that they would consider other gods. Here's what he was saying. You've got to make a stand now. He understood that he had given such a, a uh, bold statement of all that God had done to them. There was nobody else that they would want to serve but the Lord. But he was asking them, they needed to decide. You cannot be lukewarm. You cannot put one foot in the world and one foot in to serving the Lord. You have to serve the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. He knew that they would worship something, and if you don't believe it, you're worshiping something. Even if you today came in here and said this, if you today came in and said, you know what, I don't believe in this religion thing, I'm just here because a friend invited me, do you know that you're still worshiping something? You're worshiping your job. You're probably trying to get as far advanced in your job, and that consumes you. And you work 60 and 70 hour days just so you can get further in your job. You're worshiping your family because all you do is care about your family and you don't think about anybody else, and you put your family first over everything. Why? Well, I mean, that's a great excuse, right, that I put my family first. Here's the thing. God wants you to put your family uh, and, and ser serve them and love them, but they should never take precedence over serving the Lord. You begin to look at other areas that people are putting before the Lord. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's your, your uh, sexual life. That's one nobody likes to talk about, right? Maybe it's porn. Maybe it's uh, uh, sexual immorality. Maybe it's uh, premarital sex. And that's one that we kind of try to disregard. Well, as long as I get married after, is that okay? As long as, I mean, we're, we're right now, we're going to get married. Isn't premarital, I mean, doesn't God just already, you know, no, God's here saying this, that's sin, and that's separating you from the Lord from a relationship that he has for you to serve the Lord. It is a hindrance in your life. And he's saying this, choose today to recommit your lives and get rid of that stuff and serve me. Matthew 6, 24 says this. It says, no one can serve two masters for either he has to hate one and love the other or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So that's just a reminder that we cannot serve both God and the other things in our life that we 
distract us from serving the Lord. I think this is so important for us not to miss, and I'm going to speak directly to the men in this. Joshua led the charge to serve the Lord. He says this, he says, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And men, here's the truth. If you will serve the Lord, your family will follow. But if your wife or your kids are leading the charge and you're sitting there, uh, sitting in neutral, you are um, leading destruction. I'm telling you, I'm seeing too many kids that end up graduating out of high school. They, you brought them to church. You brought them to church. They get out of high school, and guess what? They go off crazy. Why? The parents stayed home. The parents weren't hardly here. The parents never were the godly example in their life. Joshua says this. He says, as for me and my house, I'll speak for all of them. We will serve the Lord. They're the head of the example in this. God's calling us to this. And let's read um, Joshua chapter 1. I want you to go back to Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to read the verse, first nine verses. And again, this is how Joshua sustained his relationship with the Lord. And he could stand there today uh, with them and say this to them. It says in Joshua chapter 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of uh, Nun, uh, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and go to the Jordan, and you and all the people to the land which I am giving you and the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give to you, uh, or has been given to you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness of Lebanon to the far great river, the river of Euphrates, all the lands of the Hittites and the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage for this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according all of the law which the Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And it says, the book, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you should observe to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you have, and uh, will have good success. He says, have I not commanded you be strong of good courage? Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So here's what we look at. Joshua is an example. He didn't let God's word... Um, out of his mouth, he understood that that was what sustained him. That's how he was able to lead this charge and saying, there's no other God I was willing to serve because of my relationship. And I believe exactly what happened to the Israelites is their relationship started to waver over time, right? After all that God had done, their relationship started waving, wavering. So we go in verses 16 through 18, and the Israelites assured Joshua they wanted to worship and serve the Lord, uh, basically saying this, you, you've given us all this reminder, how else could we not serve the Lord? And I begin to think about after that sales pitch, I think anybody would be crazy to say, you know, after all you just said, nah, I don't want that, God. Uh, and here's what Joshua understood. He, he understood the plea that he gave them. And see, they responded quickly. And I want you to look at that in verse 18. And it says, uh, or excuse me, verse 16. It says, and the people answered and said, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us out of Egypt and the land. And then it goes down towards the end of the verse 18. We also will serve the Lord for he is our God. And so again, they're, they're overly saying, hey, after everything you said, we'd be crazy not to serve the Lord. But Joshua uh, challenges them a little bit more, and this is really where Israel's recommitment is, and this is where we're going to kind of try to land the plane as we, we close out. Israel's recommitment after he had reminded them of all the blessings that God had given them, after he had challenged them to recommitment. He was giving the charge of recommitment. Israel starts to recommit, but here's what happens in verse 19, which will cause some of you to pause, and it did me as well. It says, but Joshua said to the people, after they had said they would serve the Lord, Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. Here's what he was saying to the Israelites. Count the cost. He says, I don't want you to commit to this, and in two weeks, turn, turn back away. And if you go back, and I don't have time to do this, you go back to the original Mosaic Covenant. The people came before the Lord, they made a covenant, and two weeks later, they made an idol to worship to. Joshua understood, they needed to understand, this wasn't something they could just say, yeah, after what you said, we'll serve the Lord. No, he wanted them to understand, no, 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 you gotta count the cost. You gotta understand that if you waver, in this, the Lord will bring about wrath, will bring about judgment. And I just want you to understand this. If you think that's unfair, if you think that's unfair, you do not understand our God. 
Our God is a loving God that has given us an opportunity of an out. What's that out? Every single thing that we've ever done against God can be forgiven because of his son Jesus, and he gave up everything to send him here. Amen. That is a loving God. Now, a God that also brings about wrath in your life whenever you sin against him, and you say, hey, that's not right. Here's the thing. You were never raised by a parent that disciplined you. Here's what I understand with my kids. I love them very, very much, but there are times when they disobey. And if I do not respond in some form of punishment, they will always and live continuously in their life in disobedience. Right. Here's what the Lord is saying. I love you too much to let you disobey. I love you too much to let you sin successfully. So when sin happens, there's consequences. When sin happens, there's going to come about some punishment in your life. And God's going to bring that into your life as a way for you to say, hey, stop, this isn't right, come back. And here's what the Lord's saying the whole time. I have my arms open wide. I will forgive your sins as far as the east is from the west. Amen. So understand this. Whenever Joshua's helping them understand that if they do not truly commit to the Lord, here's the punishment that will come. Here's the, it's not because he didn't love them. He wanted them to know all of the truth. He didn't want them thinking that uh, they could get out of, uh, you know, just not serving the Lord with a whole heart um, with that. And so Joshua is basically saying this, you don't know what you're committing to. He says, you're not serious enough about this. You don't realize how holy a God it is that, we, uh, that, if, uh, that he won't ignore your sin and idolatry. Uh, he says, God won't let you sin successfully in this. Joshua's stern words were meant to make sure they were taking an honest look into their own hearts. And so here's what happened. I'm going to kind of walk through this quickly. Verse 20 um, Actually, let's just go 21. It says, And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. And my, my Bible has an exclamation point there, and I think that's them saying this. No, we get it. We understand the cost. We understand the cost it's going to take to serve the Lord. No, we, we, we get it. We will serve the Lord. And so here's what Joshua goes. He goes on and he continues, and he says this. Uh, so Joshua said before the people, You are witnesses against yourself, and you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve. And he goes on and he says this in verse 23. Here's now his reminder. Here's his call saying this. If your commitment, this is Israel's recommitment to the Lord. Now, therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord. And I know Pastor Chad's taught us enough about this. We all understand recline because I would say 90% of us will go home and recline and relax after church today. But he's saying this incline. He's saying, come near to me. Get close to me. Do not, and that's why I'm talking about, this is a life that will be a life that is serving the Lord, but we one that is constantly inclined to his heart, constantly inclined to his word. But when we recline, and that's where the Israelites were, they were in recline mode, right? They'd gotten so far away from the Lord, and that's why he says this. He says, incline your hearts to the Lord. He goes in verse 25, and he says, so uh, actually, let me finish up 24. It says, the Lord, our God, we will serve, and his voice will, will obey and you know, that began to ring in my ears as I, I just began to hear, I bet you all the Israelites were repeating that together in unison. The Lord our God, we will serve and his voice will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with him that day. He, he wrote it in the book of the law. He wrote it on the stone. He says, this stone is a witness to all of this. He says, this shall be a witness before you. Every time you see it, you should be reminded of this covenant that we made to serve the Lord all the days of our life and to forsake the gods that are in our life, the things that have so easily distracted us. And then the question that we want to know in this, and this is, I think, so important for us, is this where the story ends for the Israelites? Is this where the story ends? You know, they were committed and they lived happily ever after, right? Do you believe that we can learn from people's uh, past experiences? I, I do. I, I, I honestly, I don't know how many times I watch somebody do something before I have to go up and do it, right? Or I watch somebody's life and I say, hey, this is an area of my life that I can make sure I do something different or I can fall off their pattern, right? So today we can take the, this story of Joshua and we can follow the pattern of recommitment, right? What he's calling us to and recommitting our life to. But here's something else we can follow. We can learn from their mistakes. Here's something that's, that, that was good, right? Let me read this, verse 31 of Joshua, which we didn't read earlier. Verse 31 of Joshua 24 says this. It says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. And so we sit here and say, man, that commitment worked, and it did. It really worked. But let's look at what happened in the next generation. I want you to just flip. It's not very far. A couple more pages. Judges chapter 2. Verses 10 through 15. Judges chapter 2, 10 through 15. Here's what it says. 
It says, when all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, and this is speaking of Joshua and all those elders after they had passed on, it says, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord and to their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods among the gods of the people who were around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the um, whatever that word is, and the anger of the Lord who was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of the plunders and who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around them. And so think about this. They left this covenant renewal. They committed their lives to the Lord to serve him the rest of their lives, and they did it. But they failed the next generation. You want to know, you want to know what I believe happened? I believe this has happened in the church. I believe we've had churches that have been passionate for the Lord, but they never pass that down to their children. They never pass that down to the children because what happened? They were too busy focusing on themselves. They were too busy just trying to not mess up. They, they had forgot about the next generation. See, Joshua did a good job. Joshua was the leader of these people, but then he allowed the elders to be the leaders after that. And they held it, you know, par until basically the next generation came, but they forgot to pass that on. And I hope that we aren't the generation that drops the ball. We need to understand that is how we serve the Lord, our children will serve, serve the Lord. How we serve the Lord, our children will serve the Lord. And I think too many times we try to make this excuse. Well, as long as my children are in church, as long as my children know the Lord, you know, that's all I care. And I, I'm telling you, I remember being that parent back before I was lost. You don't want to know why we started going to church? We had our first child, and this is what I said. Well, I want my child to grow up in church. And, but I didn't think about myself, right? And so we can't miss that. So let me, let me I'm, I'm closing. I'm seriously closing here. So Ben, why did you bring up uh, and have us read through almost the whole book of Joshua 24? I, I believe God wants us to see and understand that one, God's word is truth, it's timeless, that we have something to learn from every scripture. And this is one where God Again, called the Israelites to, again, look at their history and reflect. God has called us that same thing, to reflect. God is calling us to a recommitment of our lives and to say, you know what? Forsake all the gods that so distracted us and so entangled us. He's calling us to serve him wholeheartedly. We cannot be on both sides. You cannot be in neutral. I hope you understand that. Today, if you don't make a decision... And this decision is for the church, and this decision is for those who don't know Christ. I want you to know that. It's for both of you. But if you choose not to make a decision, you make a decision. So many times we think, well, I just won't make a decision today. You made a decision. Amen. And so today the Lord has called us to this. And so here's my challenge for you. I'm calling Crescent Valley Baptist Church, those who are in here today, I'm calling you to choose whom you will serve. And you'll say this, but I already did that. No, I'm asking you for a recommitment today. I believe it is biblical and I believe it is holy for us to recommit our lives to Christ. But here's the thing. That some of us are going to try to recommit something we never had. And that's where I really want to speak to today. I don't want you to miss that. We cannot recommit something we never had. We never truly surrendered our lives to the Lord. It's, it's never happened. Now, we've tried to fake it, but it didn't work. The Lord is saying this. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you say, this is my first commitment. But there's going to be many in this room that you were hot-hearted for the Lord and you have fallen away. And that's exactly what we spent this last week doing, reviving our hearts to remember all that God's done for us and all that God can do for us. And he's asking us this, whom will you serve? Because when you leave this building today, you will be serving something, either the God of yourself, the God of your past, or the one true God.